Welcome to Unleash Your Inspired Voice, the podcast that focuses on developing a more conscious-minded, heart-centered approach to life and business. And now here to introduce today's special guest is the host of Unleash Your Inspired Voice, author, content strategist, and unity consciousness activist, Peter Clark Nelson. Hey, what's going on, beautiful souls? My name is Peter Clark Nelson, the host for Unleash Your Inspired Voice. My guest for today's show is world fusion violinist, entertainer, and visionary, Batman Saram. During this incredibly inspiring and uplifting episode, Batman and myself will dive into topics such as childhood displacement, self-acceptance, resilience, reconciling intergenerational trauma and loss through love, and the awesome power of saying yes to one's inner calling. Batman Saram is an artist, violinist, composer, producer, and singer-songwriter whose music ties together many cultures and expressions into an ecstatic celebration of life. Based in San Diego, California, Batman and his group, the Mystic Groove Collective, have been together for over 15 years, winning over audiences with their passion and unlimited energy that vibrates through their performances and diverse musical palette. Batman is also the visionary behind the groundbreaking Refugee Songs, a new musical and concert experience that weaves together an original world fusion and acoustic rock musical score with spoken word poetry and storytelling inspired by Batman's experience fleeing Iran with his family following the Iranian Revolution in 1979. To get things started, we're going to highlight a brief clip from one of Batman and the Mystic Groove Collective's uplifting and musically activating performances. What's going on, beautiful souls? Welcome to a new episode of the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast. This is the show that teaches you how to joyously scale your consciousness while learning how to profitably scale a heart-centered business. And there is no better person than to talk about how to actually do that and also convey what it looks and feels like to walk the talk of unity consciousness then my next guest, Batman Saram. Batman, welcome to the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. What a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And for those of you who heard the introduction leading into this, you already know that Batman is a multi-talented musical artist, but he's also an amazing storyteller. And he has an inspiring story to share with us today. So, Batman, let's go ahead and just get things started and talk a little bit about your journey. Because when we had a chance to connect prior to this episode, you had shared with me things that just absolutely blew me away. And I, I remember getting off of that call just with a big smile on my face, just saying, thinking, how amazing is it that somebody like you exists in this world that not only went through the triumphs and the tribulations that you experienced with your family as you came here to the United States from Iran, but the way in which you've been able to go back and retrace your steps to pull out all of the beautiful experiences and lessons, and now here you are not only sharing them through music, but as you're about to launch this transcendent and groundbreaking play that's coming up called Refugee Songs, 
a musical journey, which we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about because it's really the culmination of your life experiences and all that you're doing through music. But when I finished that conversation with you, I, I just was blown away by not only just the, the depth and breadth of your musical skills and talents, but the way that you weave storytelling into the music itself. And that might not always be so just clear to people in an audience who are sitting there grooving with you and the band or just feeling immersed within that music, but you are going to be showing how that really translates into a storytelling environment with this play. So let's talk a little bit about just the music that you do with your band, the Mystic Groove Collective, and then how you came about to form this unique group of musicians. And then we can you know, move ourselves into talking about the play. Absolutely. Um, so the Mystic Groove Collective is my band. and We've been together a total of, uh, hard to believe now, 15 years. Uh, started out humbly and small and in coffee shops. And uh, my guitar player, who's been with me since the day I met him, we built a band around uh, kind of the ideas that I was bringing forth in uh, a fusion of Middle Eastern and Persian music, but fusing that with modern music to, to make it our own style. And we did that. We did that for a good long time, and we lived the dream. We really did. Together, we built the band. Um, we've now released four albums together. At one point, it was a full-time thing for all of us. Um, I was able to put this band on three cross-country tours, four albums. We were working musicians at one point, doing it for, at that time, what, what the dream was. And like anything, I think for anything valuable, we evolved. We evolved as people individually, and then this energy that is the mystic groove evolved as well. Um, that involvement came through spiritual music, through kirtan, through the art of call and response, which about almost 10 years ago, I got pulled into magically, and it changed my musical perspective. It changed my, my, my life perspective. Um, I was getting hired in addition to playing with my own band, getting just hired as a violinist to go out to Los Angeles to record, to play with a flamenco band, to play with this band. And then a friend of a friend in this beautiful blessed place. I'm so lucky to live in North County, San Diego, said, you know, there's this yoga chanting event happening. And I think violin, I'll never forget Ari, my, my brother of brothers, Ari Marsh, a spectacular fusion kirtan drummer and artist said, you know, the thought is the violin represents the female energy. And he goes, this is a very kind of male event. We've got me on African drums. We've got that going. We've got the chanting going. We need that embodiment. I think you, I'm like, what do I do? Like, I'm used to having a chart or like playing for this person. He's like, well, I think that's the beauty of it is you, you know how to improv. The key is now, though, you're not improv, improvising just with the musicians to your left and right. You're improvising with the craft and their energy and what it is that they need. And my first time looking back to me wasn't perfect, but I guess it was good enough that I started getting called on as like the violinist for kirtan events, for conscious events. So as it goes, this is what started the involvement and the maturation of the band because game over. I came back to the band after a few of these tours doing things like that and Boxy Fest and Shakti Fest. And I came back to the band, I'll never forget. It was, it was so clear to me. There was no doubt, no reservation. And in one of our rehearsals, I said, okay, change in direction. And of course, everyone's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I want this to now have some kind of conscious meaning. And I don't mean playing it for a conscious meaning from anything but truly what we want the, the folks now to get from it, which is this exchange of energy. We had been so trained and on these tours and playing weddings and playing corporate events that it's all about us generating this energy outward. And it's all on us. The pressure was all on us. I said, the beautiful thing about conscious and spiritual music is that's not the expectation. The expectation is that we're putting enough out there so that they give it back so that we can return it. And as you can see, that cycle. And not to my surprise, these beautiful beings who I've been lucky enough to be with for so long and such a diverse group of musicians and backgrounds 
We're like, okay, just guide us. Just tell us how to go there. I said, all right, I'm going to be discovering some of it on my own, but let's do it. So we did. We really manifested it. And I put out on my vision board for that next year. I kind of like literally almost put it, I think I put on the vision board uh, an X or some kind of representation on like being a corporate musician and not, I'm not judging this. I'm just saying what it was for me at the time. Being a corporate musician and musicians playing at weddings and I started putting pictures. So talking about improvisation. So we just had a bit of an issue there with the internet connection. So Batman, let's circle back where the the internet was freezing there. And you were talking about you had an a vision board and you put an X over the, the corporate uh, you know events. And, and obviously that was a way of you saying, okay, this is the old timeline. I'm not going to be going down that road anymore. So let's pick up a little bit right there and, and take us through like yeah. how that journey continued to, to unfold for you. Well, that's well said. I didn't even think of uh, putting it so eloquently as you did. I wanted to manifest with love, letting go our old timeline, with absolute love, no judgment on what we were. Frankly, what we were was paying the bills. It paid for three tours. It paid for this band getting tight with each other and making three studio length, full length albums that did very well in our circle. I, but I'm letting that go with love and saying that one sign that I picked up from a magazine cut out, music makes a difference. New music can make a difference. That's what it was. And that was the center of the vision board. And then everything else was built around that. And it started working. We, we started getting um, lots of invitations to um, yoga studios. I put together actually at the same time, I was like, you know, part of manifestation is maybe creating your own space, which is what we're big into and know that we sometimes have to create our own space. I said, while that's picking up, why don't I create my own space for this? Um, and I uh, partnered with a, a yoga studio at, in La Jolla and I built a concept that came to me one night called Zen House Concerts, except it wasn't at a house, it was at a yoga studio. And each concert featured a spiritual artist, a, fit, a featured spiritual artist. Sometimes it would be um, artists from India, from all over the country, and our band would be the opener. We, I wasn't about us being the attention every time. That would get boring. Um, but it worked. We were the opening for these really great artists that started to get us out there. And then next thing you know, we're getting asked to headline house concerts and yoga studios. And really, it, it really just took off from there to, to where we are today with putting on this, this musical journey, um, which is our version. You know, as we started to, to get into doing what I call our version of Kirtan, um, uh, a word that started spreading around that I didn't invent. We just picked up the energy of it, the embodiment. Um, uh, uh, fusion kirtan or kirtan fusion music, which is the embodiment of kirtan, which is call and response, but sometimes with English words and not just Sanskrit. And sometimes it not being just about being in a space of sitting, but why can't people be up and dancing and chanting with you? So that's, we took that old energy of that touring band with belly dancers and Middle Eastern music, and we fused it with this idea that, hey, we're going to get you up on your feet to chant and, and cry out to divine love together, but you don't necessarily have to be sitting the whole time. So uh, that's how everything kind of evolved from there to, to like I said, this, this play we're putting on in October uh, about, the, about a musical journey telling that same story with the same idea that we're all one, no matter what our background, no matter how we came here and how we came here is a subjective term, of course, in, and we're all in the same, we're all in the same boat. Wow. There's so much I want to build on from what you were talking about. And since we're yeah. talking about you, you were just finishing up there by referring to the play. So I, I want to dive into that right now, but I definitely want us to circle back to the experience of that life altering, career altering pivot that you made by listening to the calling of your heart and saying, okay, yes, we're doing good as far as a band is concerned and we're working musicians, which when you take a look at, you know, the literally tens of millions of musicians around the world, 
you know, maybe not everybody is dreaming of getting signed by a major record label, but I think it's safe to say that every musician would love to be able to earn a living doing what they love playing and, and just being able to experience that. And so you and the Mystic Groove Collective were certainly living the dream at that level. You'd had those full length albums, but yep. the shift took place. And I definitely, like I said, I want to circle back to that because so many people that, that tune into the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast, they have these spiritually driven businesses, they're heart-centered entrepreneurs, and it's not often that people look at a musical group as a quote-unquote business, but essentially it is. It's a collection. 100%. Absolutely. And I love the way that you talked about the inclusion of the audience and the way you were discussing you know, for that period of time, you and your bandmates were responsible for creating the energy. And when you made that significant shift, it part of it was allowing the audience to exchange the energy with you. And it it vividly reminds me of the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, which was the about Queen. I just watched it this last week, which is just amazing. But one of the key components of that journey that they at least shared it in the film was the way in which Queen worked with its audience. And from all the bandmates, Freddie Mercury, Brian May, everyone, you know, they, they consciously were working with that audience to give them the prompt and the allowance to be a part of the show. So that takes us into the play, right? So you've got this incredible convergence of not only the different personalities and cultural backgrounds of the current Mystic Groove Collective, but you've also now infused this experience with writers and actors to tell the story that is directly inspired by you and your family's journey and how that particular journey, while it's distinct to you and your family, is actually a shared journey by many oh, yeah. others particularly in today's world when we hear so much about refugees and people being forced to flee the country of their origin with no idea where they're going. And it's very easy for people to just see a headline or to hear a sound bite in the news and not fully associate to the human experience that's taking place. And it's a very human experience. It's a very scary one. And oftentimes as someone's going through that, they can feel as if their life is coming to a conclusion, which in many ways it is in one level, but there's a new opportunity. And in that new opportunity, though, if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling persecuted, then your sense of self-worth is going to, it's going to take a, a, a definitive hit. But how do you rebound from that? And you certainly embody what that looks and feels like. So let's talk about this play and what it what the inspiration of it was, where it came from as far as the journey with your family and how this whole thing came about. Absolutely. One of the things that I'd be remiss that you said again so beautifully is uh, a good dear, dear artist friend of mine, do yourself a favor, go see uh, a YouTube in TEDx conferences called Poet Ali uh, and his discussion of communication and what communication is. And I'll just take a little snippet of that to, to top uh, what you said beautifully, because his TEDx was about this concept of, he literally took the audience to this journey of, have you ever, do you remember being a kid and being in the cafeteria and you go to sit at a table and they're like, that's the popular crowd? And you just weren't part of the popular crowd. Raise your hand in this huge TEDx audience. A lot of people said, who has this shared experience? And a lot of people raised their hands. He said, well, you now can absolutely attest to what it feels like to be left out. That is a shared communication you have with anybody that's a refugee, with anybody that's ever been rejected, right? It's this idea of this, this shared thing that we may not even know we've experienced. So that's the whole point of our play is, yes, we're telling the story of, of my family, and, and, and I'll get to that because I want to honor what you asked about how this came about. And how this came about is the very culmination of being inspired, unleashing that inspiration. So about a year and a half ago, the band's doing its thing. We're playing spiritual festivals. We're playing some really cool like events. Um, 
raising money for a good cause and doing chanting and meditation with the crowd in order to have that event go well. Things are going. We're, we're doing what we're doing. And I woke up one morning and I didn't even know where it came from. I'm like, hmm. Next rehearsal, I said to the band, what do you guys think about telling a musical story about my family fleeing Iran at the age of three and a half for me, 1979, Iranian Revolution, and all the things that we went through. But hold on, I had their attention. It was great. It was perfect. I was like, now hold on. Here's the kicker. My family story is the vehicle to tell the journey of all Iranians, not just our family. We need a story. So we're going to use my family as a story. But what if the music, could you imagine if the music connected with everybody that fled Iran at that time? And that's where the focus was. And the band's like, we're in. Like, what do we have to do? Seven months, these beautiful, beautiful beings work day and night. All of us have day jobs in some capacity. We're all full-time musicians on the side. We all have wives and kids and responsibilities. And yet, because this dream was so strong and not having anything to do with me, because this came through me, I take no responsibility. But this, this feeling was so strong in everybody that the tiredness didn't matter. The restlessness didn't matter from being tired. Everyone worked their butts up in this homegrown little musical at the time in its stage uh, debuted at Vision Spiritual Center in San Diego, which is where my drummer, our world percussionist fusion drummer, Dan Ochipinti, has been the drummer for the Vision Spiritual Center for the last 10 years. And a funny story, the way that came about, if I can take you a step back, which just shows you if you follow the signs, the way that came about to even be able to put on our initial concept of the Vision Spiritual Center was Dan came to the band one day and said, hey, there's this group called Playing for Change. And if you've never heard of Playing for Change, YouTube them. They're this amazing nonprofit that their first premiere video had like 30 million views. And they go around the world videotaping musicians with headphones on. And the musicians are all playing to each other. So they'll go to Ghana and record the song Stand By Me and the drummer is putting on headphones, playing to the guitar from a, a flamenco guitarist in Spain. Unbelievable nonprofit organization. They turn those funds into giving back to the world. Unbelievable. So our drummer said, hey, Playing for Change is having a fundraiser at our Vision Spiritual Center, and they're looking for bands. There's no pay. The last time this band played for no pay, I can't tell you. It was a long time. It was the coffee shop day. But those words came out of Dan's mouth and I said, we're in. I said, yeah, you don't even need to tell me anything more. We're in. Why was that so profound? Because we played at this sold out fundraiser, not getting paid in green currency, but there was a lot of this currency. Uh, we were the headline band. We did very well just as far as the crowd reaction. Played on this gorgeous professional stage. And this idea of putting on this musical was brewing in my head. It was after that, I said to the man, I think we found our stage. Let's put on the show here. Vision Spiritual Center said, we're in. What do we have to do? We sold it out. 130 people did, came and experienced. And that's the whole idea of our band, Peter, this whole time has been we want to put on an experience for people. I told the band a long time ago, I'm done putting on a performance. Performance, in my definition, no judgment, is a one-way street. An experience is a two-way street. And that's what Kirtan taught me, right? That's where it all came from. So, you know, we were really in the state of mind of that this is a shared experience. And people who came to that, with my wife doing the homegrown PowerPoint visual representation of where in the story my family was fleeing Iran, coming to America, identity crisis, you name it. This little homegrown play, we had people crying, we had people laughing, and of course, we had people dancing. It all happened, exactly like I told the band it would. And what's the other key here, my friend? The whole time through those midnight phone calls about our script and what should we do, I kept telling the band, again, something that came through me that I didn't plan on, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to let you know, I feel very strongly that something's going to come of this. 
I don't know what that is. I can't even begin to paint that picture for you, but I know something is going to come of this. We put on this show, it goes well, and a professor at UCSD reaches out the next day, my dear friend Anita of 15 years, Professor Anita Casavantes Bradford, and says, stunning. Most amazing thing, she's followed the band since day one. This is the most amazing thing I've ever felt from you guys. There's a nonprofit on campus called the uh, Critical Refugee Studies. We have one week left of a grant they're offering for 2019. How about you and me put together a proposal because they just opened up this artist path. They've never done that before. It's always been for professors and researchers. What do you say? And I really was in this state of, well, what do we have to lose? We're a band getting a grant from a university. That's never going to happen. I'm not worried about it. Sure. She's got a family too. We're up till 2 a.m. for one week writing a 10 page proposal, the budget. I've never written a proposal for a university. Don't even know what that's like. She was guiding me. And lo and behold, four months later, we get the word that out of a big pool of applicants, this little band from San Diego, who four years earlier was playing corporate events and weddings, got a grant from the University of San Diego to put on a show about all refugees from all walks of life and musically expressing to everybody what that journey is like to let you know you are not alone if you've ever experienced this. If you're going through it now, you're not alone. We share your feelings. And through the music and the poetry, we are expressing to you that we share this common ground and we got your back and again not to be hyperbolic but we're all one we really are including the fact that you may have never been a refugee so you don't know that experience but have you ever been rejected have you ever wanted to be part of a crowd and you weren't then you're part of this too let's all share in this night together wow i i love the the synchronization of it, like you said, just before you started to share all of that was the signs. And to your credit, you're just, you're saying yes. And this goes back again to when the guidance came through to shift the band's journey, you're saying yes. And it's, you're saying yes to something that up to that point has never really been done, at least not in the context of your band's experience or no. And so you are literally stepping into the unknown and to your credit as such an inspiring heart centered leader, the way in which you communicate and because of your authenticity and your vulnerability with your bandmates, when you are pitching the concept, they're instantaneously getting it and it's resonating. And then they are part of this journey with you, which then to me goes back to the embodiment of what this entire play is all about, which is inclusiveness. It's, the, it's shining a light on feeling isolated and feeling alone and feeling rejected. And when you realize that that's a temporary experience that can be transcended into a world of unlimited possibilities, where you are part of something that's much bigger than you, your band is a microcosm of this larger context of humanity and unity consciousness, which is why when we started this episode, I was just saying how much you embody and how much the Mystic Groove Collective embodies what unity consciousness looks and feels like. And it's, it, it can take all these different shapes and sizes and sounds, but in your particular case, you are using together experiences that don't often seem to, to make sense from a casual observer. You know, so you've got a band that's playing all different kinds of music, and yet consciousness and spiritual aspect and kirtan, that wasn't part of it, and yet you made it work. And here you are with a background that is shared amongst many from your country, and yet I'm sure while some of them have done some amazing things to share that experience with others, you're doing it in a very unique way that again is inviting people to be a part of it, which to me is again, that whole invitation. It's like, Hey, I see you. We're shining a light mm. on you and we're letting you know it's okay to be seen, to be heard, to be felt because you have something. 
to share with the world. And so when people can feel that in an environment like with the music and the play, that's just, it's remarkable, man. I, I got to give you, I, I just give you so much respect for what you're doing. So I, let's talk a little bit about this journey, right? So you and your family mm-hmm. are fleeing Iran and mm-hmm. you're doing so at a time where there is an enormous revolution and upheaval in this country. So you're not the only ones that are having to leave. And yet I'm sure that in the experience, you felt like you were the only ones that were having to leave because it was like, this is us, this is our, our family and we're entering into the literal unknown. So how was that experience influencing you to become a musician? And how did that experience influence you to be the one who is essentially, I wouldn't say necessarily just, I mean, you're the leader of the band. I mean, you're the one that's come up with these ideas. You're the one that's saying, look, I'm going to go out there and do this. And then you're also saying yes, and you're bringing these amazing individuals together to form this soul family. So how did, those, mm-hmm. how did, how did your early childhood influences of, of fleeing Iran to coming to the States play a role in the journey that you ended up being on and that you're still on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'll start for a minute on the, on the front end, the today end, because you said something that triggered um, something I think you and I were talking about before we got started, which is, this band is the very embodiment of the message that it's putting out, this inclusiveness that you mentioned, because you got a Persian American violinist band leader, you have a blues guitarist with a blues background that'll blow away any audience member with just three, he'll, he's one of those guitarist reverend stick man that just plays three notes and he's got you. He's got you in the blues and he's got such a diverse background, but blues is where he comes from and here he is playing Persian music with this guy. And we've got a drummer who's a self-taught drummer who now I would take him to the Middle East today and have him teach some Middle Eastern folks about how to play Middle Eastern rhythms. And you've got a bass player who's an Emmy award winning songwriter and singer in his own right. This is all not at all attaching anything to ego. I'm trying to point out the diversity that you talked about. Yeah. Because this very band embodies the message we're putting about, about inclusivity, about don't judge a book by its cover. And that's, I'll tell you, that's one of the magic tricks I love about this band back in the touring days and in Kirtan days. When we walk in a room with our instruments, there's always that look of what, like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, I always come in my, I come in my little gypsy outfit and I got my Persian piano player and then you got our drummer Dan in his gypsy outfit a blues guitarist with long curly hair and his blues jazz hat. And literally people don't know what to do with us. Now I'll say humbly speaking till they hear us. And then immediately they get it. Because mm-hmm. here's this bunch playing Middle Eastern fusion, kirtan, conscious music, and they get it. They get that we embody that. So now back to, back to your question. Yeah, so we fled. I was, I was three and a half, four. We fled as a lot of Iranians did at the time of uh, the revolution, where um, a lot of things were suppressed, including music um, and just freedoms that we used to have. And it was overnight. And so uh, the sacrifice that my and millions of parents made was time to get out. You know, this is not the place to thrive. Um, We went to Vienna first, and this is all in the play. So this is all in the play, this story of, I was going first to Vienna because that was the first place that we had a landing spot. It's where my dad found a job. He had friends who had fled earlier. So it's where we had to go. A year there, the kids, us bratty kids, learned some German just to get by. And then we uh, landed in Philadelphia. We um, landed in Philadelphia with $20 to my dad's name in his pocket because one of the rules of that revolution, each revolution is different, was you can leave, but anything of value belongs to us. So you can leave, but anything of value belongs. That's why a lot of people, you hear that it's not an exaggeration. It is a story. Came to this country with $50 in our pockets. It's because you had to leave everything behind. So relating to what you said earlier, right there is that spiritual kind of lesson that um, a lot of the gurus spend time working with their clients on, which is so true, right? 
from the biggest break from the biggest breakdowns come the biggest breakthrough. This idea of shedding yourself in a spiritual journey, well, we were forced to do it. That was part of our, we didn't have a choice. So we had to do, you know, and you had no choice but to now learn English and learn the ways of, 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 of this country. But that's not easy, right? Spiritual growth is not easy. So it's spiritual growth, being a refugee, all of it's not easy because to get to that place of growth, what do you have to go through? On our path, and a lot of people, you're adjusting to a completely new culture. You're adjusting to not having family around the extended family that you would have in your homeland. Yeah. Then you're dealing with bullying, racism. Uh, I hit uh, the home run, if you will, to use a sports analogy. I was overweight, couldn't speak the language, and got sad really easily. So I just, boy, for bullies, I was just the perfect target. And, uh, but all of that looking back is part of the growth, right, Peter? Like that's, it's painful at the time and it was. And if I put myself in that place, I can feel that pain. But that's also what led me to where, where we are today, right? Is, is doing that, learning to, to now be part of the American culture, um, which again, you had no choice. When I was brought here at four years old, like a lot of refugees, like a lot of immigrants, an, an argument I guarantee you every, which is also part of this inclusivity of the play, there's a scene in the play, which is literally about this premise of all of immigrant kids have had this argument with our parents. Hey, you're losing your culture. Hey, you're forgetting about the homeland. Hey, don't talk to me. Time out. You brought me here when I was four years old. A majority of my life has been in this place. We can't revert back to where we can have our homeland in our heart and never forget it. But you can't expect me to live by those rules. I was thrown into the fire here and had to adjust to survive and live the American culture. So that's, that's a really in interesting kind of conflict of part of the play that we represent through the poetry and the music. And then to finish up just to what you were asking is, all of that is what fueled music. Since the day I came to America, being in a private conservatory, learning uh, Mozart and Beethoven, I was classically trained. And at about age 18, I had had it. I just had it with Mozart. If I played one more classical piece, I was going to lose my mind. I went to college without my violin. I was like, I'm done. I met my best friend of 27 years. I'll age myself 27 years. Um, I'm actually 75. I just dyed my hair. Um, <laughs> a, my, my best friend of 27 years in the dorm room next to me. Oh, I heard you play violin. I'm a jazz train piano player. You want to play? Do I want to play what? I, you do you know Beethoven? Well, I don't know Beethoven, but you know, I could teach you a few things. Went home, got the violin, went downstairs to the basement on an old raggedy out of tune piano and Chris Rowland changed my life. I had a lot of uh, life-changing moments through music um, because I'd kind of given up on it, right? And taught me this idea of improv. Our first song was Eric Clapton's You Look Wonderful Tonight. He played a jazz version on piano. I'm like, what do you want me to do? Where's the charts? Where's my result? Where's the Beethoven notes? He's like, no, no, Where's no. Where's the guitar? It's his <laughs> <That's Eric. laughs> Exactly. Where is Eric Clapton? And so long story short, he's like, just, here's the key. You know keys. We were trained on keys. I mean, just play. Game over, Peter. Game over. Hooked. Hooked. Absolutely hooked. We joined band after band after band. And while we were joining band after band, this is still back in Philly. This is exactly what the play is about. The motherland music comes back. Because now that I'm able to improv and be a little bit looser, my mom's like, you want to learn one of the old folk songs from the old homeland? Because my mom was a singer. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. Ding, ding. What do we do? Hook. Hearing my mom sing a song from the 50s from Iran, an old Persian folk tune. Me learning it on violin by ear, not having charts. Next thing you know, at the Persian gatherings, we would be like requested. The mother and son duet. So 
full circle, right? You asked about how that influenced. There it was. On one side, this best friend, this light in my life of 27 years, saying, just play, let's play some Eric Clapton, that leading to the freedom of, I can play Persian music too. And all of that is really like that story. Then eventually when I moved to San Diego and started the Mystic Groove Collective, what made the band what it is? We're going to be everything. I, this is my life. My music is my life. I'm not going to sit here and tell you we're an all Persian band. We're an all American band. We're not because that's not me. I am a little bit in this broth, a little bit of everything. And so is my music. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's your whole journey is it, it it's just a series of yeses where you mm. could have easily justified saying no. And like, for example, your friend Chris, who at the time, you know, you, you didn't know him to the extent you obviously do now, but he's, inter he, you know, he's asking you, hey, you, you want to jam? You want to, you know, and you're like, what? Like, I'm given, you kind of give up <laughs> aspects of music. And by saying yes to something that you may not have, you might not have really been fully into at that moment, it broke something open within you and allowed you to experience in, in large part, what your soul came here to share with the rest of the world. And I, I also really love about the, the dynamic of that conversation with you and your mom because of all of the things that you personally experienced, right? The bullying, um, just the upheaval going into different countries and trying to, you know, figure out who you are and what's this place I'm now having to acclimate myself to. So many people, even if those who are listening and watching this, you don't have to directly identify what it feels like to be leaving a country as a young child, or even as an adult, to realize that on some level, each and every one of, the, of us, we've experienced levels in ex of abandonment. We've been bullied. We've been the victim, granted in some lifetime, maybe even this one, we've played the opposite end where we've been the victim and the victimizer. But the point, what I'm saying with this is that it's very easy to wear the victimhood identity as a badge of honor. And that when we get presented with opportunities to answer the calling of our soul, that we can fall back on what the victim voice inside of us is saying to us. And, you know, I'm not worthy. No one's going to like what I'm saying. You know, who am I to be received at this level? Who am I to share this? All of these things that come in. And this is one of the many reasons why I, I, I'm so honored to have an opportunity to engage with you on this level is because you are, a, you represent what it, what it really means to forego the surface level experiences to transmute, to transcend, to forgive, to reconcile all of the stuff that might be going on inside of you and to begin allowing that soul, that big infinite soul to be expressed through, you know, this human body. And that goes back to something you were saying with you and your mom, where your mom was asking you to, you know, don't forget about the homeland. And what's really interesting is like you said, look, I'm here, I'm in the present moment. I'm going to carry the homeland in my heart. I think that's a large part of what a lot of people that are being asked to rise above your past cultural uh, rules. Like if we ever want the world to look and feel better than what it has, that means we're going to have to say goodbye to some of the old cultural paradigms. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we necessarily forget them. And it certainly doesn't mean that we say goodbye to them with malice. It's that we carry the essence of them in our heart in each iteration of our journey. And it's just a beautiful way in which you and your mother were able to, to work together and to share that experience with people in, in some of the events you were talking about. I thought that was really cool. So your, your, your points are so enlightening. I, I have to mention two quick things, and I promise they'll be quick. But it's mind-blowing to me what you just said because – it's literally what the play and artistry and Kirtan and all this is about. Remember how we were saying earlier that this play is not necessarily, it's called Refugee Song, but we're, we're talking about a broader concept. And you, and you just nailed it, which is 
it doesn't have to be this argument I had with my parents. Listen, I wasn't raised in Iran. I was there till I was four. Now I'm an American. Don't expect that. That goes for the, why does it have to be being raised in Iran? What if someone was raised that their father worked one job for 60 years and he retired and it was dutiful and all that? That artist argument one has with their family, right? Because that, that's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. How many artists have had to say, I don't want that. I appreciate my father who worked for 60 years for the same company, never complained, did everything dutifully, right? But I'm an artist. I want to just shed everything and be the artist. And that's my dream. How many artists and spiritual business entrepreneurs have this clash with their family? And it is a cultural clash, isn't it? So it's literally that story that this is about. And then the yes thing is is so beautiful. Saying yes, that point that you brought up, is a habit like anything else. You can be stuck in the no phase, and but once you get stuck in the yes phase, a perfect embodiment of what you said is, as we were learning about this play and how to even work with the university in a grant, something we had never done before, a lesson for all those in this habit of yes, which is what came to me as you were talking about it, all of a sudden, uh, in the middle of it all, about two months ago, one of our plans for the music was to do what we've always done, take some famous cover songs either from the Middle East or from Spain or from Portugal, which we put our own spin on like a famous melody and make that part of the show because we've always done that. University is like, uh-uh. because this is university grant, this needs to be an all original play. Mm-hmm. The music has to be all original. Now we have made four albums and we have enough in our, in our arsenal, but we didn't have enough to fit this play. For about two seconds, I was like, nope, can't do it. No way. Can't write 11 original songs to fit this play. Not going to happen. And I was like, boop. Literally what you said. Look at all the things that got you here by saying yes. And instead, my answer, by the way, that was all that was processed in here. But what actually came out was, okay, we will do it. So now we, and then I turned to the band. And I remember when I went to the band, I'm like, I can either spin this positively and have them be excited about this, or we have to do all original. I was like, guys, guess what we get to do? What? We get to write all originals. We are not allowed to do one cover song. <laughs> and they were excited. And we started writing. So that's the embodiment of yes, I just had to, to capitalize on. Oh, I'm glad you shared that. Yeah, that's, well, see, and that's just the whole thing, right? So a lot of times people, and I, and I know this from my own personal experience, and also working with clients, and just the opportunities I've had to to speak publicly over the years is that there's this idea that w- what people see from the exterior level of confidence and charisma and okay so this person said yes and that person said yes and one thing leads to another and voila now they're a big success and the idea is well that person may never experience anxiety or doubt or you know they're used to saying yes. They probably always say yes to everything. What they don't see, what a lot of people don't see, obviously, is what goes on inside somebody's mind in the moment. It's okay to be you know, presented with an opportunity and to find yourself having some feeling of resistance immediately with it. There's nothing wrong with that. What I would invite people to do, and anyone who follows this podcast knows because we talk about this all the time, is that when that resistance comes up, when the fear, the doubt, the self-worthiness issues, whatever it might be, don't push that shit back down. Like, let it show up and let it reveal itself to you because ultimately what it's really doing is, it's like, hey, flip the script. There's another side to this experience. And when you look at it from that other side, you begin to see, like you said, you went back to, all right, I've been saying yes all these years, even when I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do and it always led me to the right thing. And so again, I get a lot yeah. of props for that. So let's talk about with, with the time that we have left here, I want to circle back mm-hmm. around. I meant, I, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast about when you had this successful flow going with the, you know, the original version of your band. So you guys were out there earning a living and doing what you love, and in most cases, loving what you do, but then there was this pivotal shift that took place within your own consciousness in your own life that 
required you to, at the very least, address the reality of whether or not you were on the right path moving forward, irregardless of whether you'd been on the right one up to that point. And I know a lot mm -hmm. of people that are spiritually driven entrepreneurs or you know, heart-centered leaders, as you just talked about, with respect to the cultural clash, it's one thing to when you make your choice, like this is the path, and it doesn't jive with people in your family. It's another when you've made that choice and you've experienced success with a business or a career, and then all of a sudden you realize to truly fulfill your soul's purpose, it requires you to make some adjustments, sometimes small, sometimes significant. And that's not always going to jive with the people that are around you. It could be clients, it could be bandmates, it could be... <laughs> <laughs> business partners it's a di it's a different culture you know situation it's maybe not family now it's soul family so mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what you were going through with respect to that shift and how some of the individuals in the band responded and how you felt about that transition because obviously you were stepping into the unknown when you had been on a journey of the known up to that point yeah, and, and what did we speak about earlier? Growth is not meant to be an easy thing, right? Evolvement is not meant to be an easy thing. If you think it is, you're, you're probably going to be disappointed. That's my one guru soapbox moment. I'll step back down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, great question. So, yeah, it wasn't easy, right? Our first, and I can't remember how many years ago and what it was, it may have been that. No, it was Zen House Concert. It was the first time me turning to my bandmates, this concept of, I know we've been well trained and we do performance well. Please remember, in, and during rehearsals, so during rehearsals, I could tell to no fault of anyone because it's what we were used to, talk about culture. When you're used to playing at weddings and being all about making sure to play music so people buy more alcohol because that's how you're getting paid, right? That, that paradigm, is what you have to do to make a living, fine. I could tell in our rehearsals before we first did our first real Zen House concert, it was up to me to lovingly say, we need to change. Because the energy of which we were coming across our instruments was as a performance. It wasn't, there's this trick that I've learned in Kirtan and conscious music alone, um, which is there's this subtle point that the greatest conscious artists from MC Yogi to Jai Utal to Krishna Das, you name them, Larissa Stowe, the amazing Larissa Stowe, is we are here, we are present, but we're going to leave enough room in this energy tunnel so that you can enter. If we fully blast out this energy tunnel, there's no room for you, you being the audience. But So I could tell when we were rehearsing, that's what the band needed to work on. And it's not about pace. It's not about beats per minute. It's not, it's embodiment. It was about embodiment. So one of the things I learned I had to do was, sorry, but I have to walk the walk. Stop talking to SHIT. So before rehearsal, instead of having coffee, and which is normally what I do, and coffee, and uh, what rock song can I put on to inspire me? Time out. Let's walk the walk. Let's put on some Krishna Das before walking into rehearsal. Let me go take a walk on the ocean before rehearsal. What kind of hypocrite would I be to show up to a bunch of my business colleagues in this music of business and say, we are changing the absolute core of what we do as a business, but I'm not going to embody that. And by the way, far from perfect. I still don't practice meditate every day. I still don't do yoga every day. I try and I'm aware of that. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Far from it. But at least in that regard, I knew I had to walk in with a different energy. And it started to work. It started to work. They started to see it. And then it's all about getting that first taste. I'll never forget the first time we played when we got them to chant something back to us. It's going through me right now. It's a very distinct feeling of we just shifted. And I remember looking at the band and seeing in their eyes, Oh, this is what you're talking about. This is what you've been feeling this whole time when you've been doing this on your own and you want us to feel it. We're in. Oh, I love that. And that's again, inclusiveness. 
because you presented an idea to the band. You didn't try to force anybody to adopt your perspective. You simply invited them. It's sort of like saying, hey, we're going to go try on some clothes. You know, let's go try on, let's just go to the store and look at a jacket. You try it on. Right. Bits, and so you invited them to try on this idea. And those that were willing to do so, they journeyed with you into the experience and they got a chance to experience it. And that's the, I love the way you talk about the dichotomy between a performance and an immersive experience. Yes, sir. You're involving the audience, but the audience is also involving the band and the musicians. Perfect. And it becomes yes. this convergence of energy. That is ultimately unity consciousness. It's, it's not that everybody looks the same. It's not everybody sounds the same. You don't sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya on the same pitch. It is where mm-hmm. you show up authentically as yourself in that moment and you harmonize with the energies. And you have been able to embody that and to share that in a way that's just truly profound. And I'm sure that everybody who's come, who's come across your live performances has walked away just feeling infused and activated and empowered. And I personally can't wait to have an opportunity to experience what you and the Mystic Group Collective do. And one of the things I, I wanted, I made a mental note for me to ask you this, because in our initial conversation, you shared with me the first time that you came across your guitarist, Reverend Stickman. And yes. again, it's yes. okay. thank you for remembering that. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, thank you for sharing that when you and I first had a chance to talk. And uh, that's just another one of those yes moments. Like, if I didn't know any better, man, I'd say you were the inspiration for Jim Carrey's yes, you know, yes man movie. It's like, all right, I'm, I'm right. Michael Jane, I got yeah. something. Yes. So let's talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Well, Jim called me before he wanted to accept the uh, role for that. And I said, I think you should take it. So, yeah, we had a good <laughs> talk about that. Um, yeah, thank you for remembering that because that is at the heart. Of, I mean, the, the band members that are with us today are the soul family. But the spark wouldn't have happened if the spark didn't happen. So I have to call it out. Another example of your beautiful sentiment, a theme you weaved into this conversation, my friend, the yes the getting used to saying yes. Almost 14, 15 years ago, I've been playing violin professionally for different people, studios in LA, playing at the Beverly Hilton for different bands, and I was ready to do my own music. It was the first time I'm like, I think I want to write my own music. How does a violinist write his own music? Well, I adored Dave Matthews Band since the day I can remember, so you're always gonna start off with who you're inspired by, my best friend, Chris Rowland, before he moved out of California, bought me a guitar. He's like, you love Dave so much. I think here's an acoustic guitar. I'm like, I'm a violinist. He's like, yeah, but I think you should just see what you can do. So I started twirling around and I wrote my first song. And I do put that heavily in air quotes because today I wouldn't consider it a song. Um, and I wrote like two songs. And I was like, so what does one do? Talk to some fellow. Well, you go to an open mic. It's what you do. You go to an open mic. And you just, you play. So here's a classically trained Persian American violinist from Philly, mouthful, uh, who now is picking up a guitar and going to a coffee shop to play uh, some ballad song about a girl that had just dumped me. Okay, let's give this a shot. Um, Was ready. Looked up in uh, in the paper at the time. That's what we did. We looked up open mics in the paper. And uh, Thursday night open mic at this Pacific Beach coffee shop, which had, just, which had just opened. Man, and I walked in there and the place was packed. This is not open mics to me. We're like, I mean, the place was packed. The list was full. They happened to have one spot left for me. I'm ready. I'm willing and able. It's now about two spots before me. This is the first time with a guitar, not my home instrument, and singing, not my home thing to do playing in front of people. I played at symphonies in front of hundreds of people, but I haven't done this. Peter, I walked out. Well, I started to walk out. I literally put the guitar back. And I'm like, nope, this is not happening. I mean, I can't to ruin my distinguished career as a symphony violinist with this. What would they think? Um, all ego, right? It's all ego. That's all that was going through, through my head. What would they think? Who is they? 
as I'm walking out, so this coffee shop had a had an outside cul-de-sac with um, with uh, picnic tables and chairs, and that's where the musicians would hang out with their cup of coffee and their muffins. And it's eight o'clock at night, beautiful summer evening. I'll never forget it. And I'm and it's funny. I'm about to walk out the front door, but I don't want the open mic host to see me because I know he's going to try to twist my arm. I walk out through the where the musicians hang out. And if I hadn't, this wouldn't happen, which is now I'm walking out and there's someone practicing and I don't even see him because it's dark and I just want to get to my car. And I hear five notes and it's never, ever happened, whether it's been live at a concert, that it, something hit me physically in the chest. And I'll never forget, I was slouching, right? Because the energy of walking out when you're about to give up on a dream, not a very good feeling, is it? I remember I was slouching I remember hearing Stickman's notes, and I remember all of a sudden my back went straight. I was like, listen, listen to this feeling. Went over, sat down, and he just kept playing for about 30 seconds. He said, hi, I'm Reverend Stickman. I said, I'm Batman. And didn't even question the words that were about to come out, because usually you're like preamble. I said, do you mind playing some music with me? I'm incredibly nervous. I don't play guitar. He goes, yeah, sure. What are we going to I said, I don't really know because I don't know the guitar, so I can't tell you like what key. He goes, all right, why don't we just play? And a relationship is born and a band is born. Mm, that's awesome. And <laughs> it's going back to the theme of this episode, right? So you said yes, you started to say no, but what also prompted you to say yes, which is something we hadn't, we haven't really talked a lot about throughout the course of this this conversation, is the power of vulnerability. Because when we say mm. yes to the unknown, it is an opportunity to develop the muscle of vulnerability, which is really where our true strength and power comes from. And yet, that's not taught to to most of us growing up. Because for most of us, when we look at society, especially for men. Vulnerability is, oh, yeah. is weakness. So for you to have been in that, as you were just eloquently describing, again, you're such an amazing storyteller, like you're slouched over and you're not, it's like, I don't want anybody to see me. You get hit into the, in the heart and soul of a, a fellow brother, somebody who's an integral part of your soul family. And rather than just acknowledge in your own mind, hey, that's some pretty cool chords, you asked him to go up on stage with you and to provide that support. And I, I, I just want to say this to everybody who's listening or watching this is on a live stream or on a replay. When you are called to, to shine your light, it is going to be a bit uncomfortable. It doesn't matter how excited you are. It doesn't matter whether you've been preparing for this your entire life, which in many ways you have been, perhaps even unconsciously. But when you get that opportunity to step into the spotlight of your soul's purpose, you're not alone and you don't need to be alone. Even if you are a solo performer, be willing to ask for help. Be willing to ask for mentorship and guidance because it's in that asking, it's in that vulnerable, that vulnerable space that your true strength, your true essence begins to come through and you will always be supported. And this goes again back to what you were talking about earlier, Batman, about that changing of the direction of the band. When you shifted that, you were met with people who were willing to receive you. And that's oftentimes not easy for a lot of people to make those significant changes in their life or their career because you get used to the people around you. You get used to the same opportunities being presented and you wonder, am I going to get the same opportunities? Am I going to get people who are going to see me and hear me and feel me? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. It's always yes. Even if you're going to get some people who don't understand you, that's a given. You're going to get people who might try to persuade you to go a different way. That's a given. But it's also a given that you will be received by people who are going to meet you at that vibration and perhaps even a little bit higher because let's face it, we all need people to see greatness in us, even if we don't see it completely in ourselves. And that's what allows us to move to that next level. So I want to commend you for that. And thank you. Oh, go ahead. 
No, I said thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank you just for sharing everything. Uh, it's, I, again, just building on those conversations we had leading up to this, and I would be remiss if we did not get ready as we conclude this, this episode. I, I want to thank our mutual friend, Cedar Rose. I know Cedar mm -hmm. and her partner, TJ Moss, they're part of the Mystic Groove Collective. And Cedar mm. was gracious enough to be the first guest on the relaunched version of the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast. She was also a guest mentor in the Activation Group program that I launched earlier this year. And as I was saying, her and her beautifully inspiring partner, TJ Moss, are part of the Mystic Groove Collective. And I just, I, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you to oh, Cedar please for serving as that bridge that connected you and I. So this has just been a, an amazing experience just to really feel and, and to hear and to, and to get a sense of the, the journey that you've been on. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for doing what you do. But as, as important as that, thank you for doing it the way that you do it. I really appreciate it. And I know all of us do that follow you and what you do. But like I said, it's the way you do it. That's the, that's the gem. Oh, thank you. Well, we're all, you know, when you stop and think about like, and I appreciate you saying that in a beautiful reflection. And it just reminds me when I look at the human collective, right? It just, we're all essentially part of a band. <laughs> we're all playing a different instrument right. with our unique energetics. Very much. We're showing up at different venues and different opportunities to, to be seen, to be heard, to be felt, not for egoic purposes, but to simply share that energy because we know that when we have an inspired message, regardless of the form by which it is shared through, we're not only empowering and inspiring others through that, but we're also helping others. We're showing others that it's, it's okay to step out. It's okay to be seen. It's okay to share our gifts and our talents because that's what we're here to do. So with that said, the upcoming event, Refugee Story, mm -hmm. a musical journey. I believe it's taking place on October 19th in San Diego. So talk a little bit about where people yeah. can go who are in the San Diego region or in Southern California who would like to be able to go and experience this, this event. Yeah, absolutely. So Refugee Songs, a musical journey, October 19th at UCSD. Um, and we're hoping, yes, as you said, to get people from all over California. Uh, the beautiful thing about this opportunity, the overwhelming uh, opportunity is it is a 650 seat, seat theater. So this is the real deal. The beautiful part, and thank you for allowing me to say this, uh, giving us the time. It's super important people know this is a free show. We are not charging a dime for anybody to show up for this experience. It's part of what we wanted to do in collaboration with the university and this grant, because we don't want money to be a blocker for you to show up and share this experience so that you can come out of this show and go out maybe, and we've done our job, if you're vibrating on this much higher of a frequency to go out and make a difference in the world. So it is an absolute opportunity for you, for you to come and see this for free at the Mandeville Theater. Uh, showtime is 7 o'clock. Doors are at 6.30. And um, we really look forward to having you there. And then just a quick bit about um, kind of the construct. The beautiful part about this journey this time, because we get to do it for real, is that it is a mix of actors, spoken word poetry, narration, and music. It's all interweaved together to share this journey with everybody. Uh, see, again, it's beautiful, man. You're just bringing all of these unique, divergent parts together and harmonizing them in, in such a beautiful story. And so I, I would also just echo what you just said to everybody who's listening or watching this. If you're in the Southern California region, the only thing you've got to pay for is the gas to drive there. Like, if you know people in your life or you're somebody that can directly relate to what it feels like to be an outcast or you're a refugee yourself, somebody who migrated into the United States from another country, this is an experience that is designed explicitly to be shared. And as Batman has been talking about, everything that he does in, in the Mystic Groove Collective is, in a, is a shared immersive experience. So even if you cannot make it on October 19th, but you know other people who might be able to, 
then by all means, reach out to them, connect them to the event information, and there's links in the post for this episode where you can go to and learn more about the upcoming play, but equally so that you can go and journey with the Mystic Groove Collective the next time they're playing live in the San Diego region. And so Batman, I just wanna again say thank you for all of the things that you've said yes to in your journey to get to this point, because for all of the amazing experiences that you have created and you've shared, I get the distinct feeling that things are just getting started for you and the Mystic Groove Collective. Peter, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for just an authentic conversation. And uh, I hope to see you in October. Absolutely. I'm definitely looking forward to going there. So uh, I'm up in Northern California, but I'm making the journey to come down and experience this. So for And you got a you, place to stay too. So no oh, worries. thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us here today, whether you've listened to this on an MP3, whether you're watching this on a live stream or you're watching this video after the live stream. Thank you for being a part of this episode of Unleash Your Inspired Voice. And as I've always said at the end of every one of these episodes, if you have an inspired message that you've already been called on or you know you're being called to share on a much larger scale, absolutely positively say yes, because the world needs to hear, feel, and see what you're here to share more than ever. Thank you for my inspired voice and grateful heart, and I look forward to having you join me on the next episode of Unleash Your Inspired Voice. As you just experienced during Batman's inspiring interview, saying yes to opportunities that are in alignment with your soul's calling not only positively changes your own life, but the lives of countless others. Whether it's through his diverse range of music or his uplifting storytelling, Batman's inspired voice is expressed through the healing power of love. As a result, he beautifully embodies what it means to do what you love and love what you do. If you are hearing or watching this episode before October 19th and are in the Southern California region, be sure to get yourself a ticket for the upcoming play, Refugee Songs. As Batman spoke about during the episode, Refugee Songs offers an intimate close-up on one young man's experience of childhood displacement and coming of age, as well as a wide range of poetic musings on the triumphs and tribulations that many displaced people experience in their own journeys. To learn more about Batman Saram and the Mystic Groove Collective, be sure to visit beviolin.com or on Facebook, you can type in beviolin27 and also visit mysticgroovecollective.com. To get access to bonus material from previous guests and episodes of the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast, as well as being notified of upcoming guests and special events, please be sure to visit unleashyourinspiredvoice.com and sign up today. I also wanna give a shout out and offer my eternal gratitude for the divinely gifted team here at the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast. Talasa Tam of Talasa Designs, who is the amazingly gifted artist behind the branding of Unleash Your Inspired Voice. To learn more about how she can bring your vision to life through beautiful and heart-centered brand design, please visit talasadesigns.com. And to my dear friend and brilliant podcast producer, Samantha Castro of Castro Creations, thank you for all you do. Without you, the Unleash Your Inspired Voice podcast would not exist as it does today. If you're seeking high-level editing, mixing, production, and support on your videos or your podcast, please be sure to visit scastrocreations.com. As always, thank you all for joining us on Unleash Your Inspired Voice and for playing an important part in giving birth to unity consciousness in our lifetime.